We spent the last couple of weeks of this year talking about Jesus, different aspects of his life, his works, that he's all God and all man, that nothing's impossible with him. And we want to spend the last service of this year talking about his birth and how significant that is to us. And I titled this message, Oh Come, Let Us Adore Him. You know, sometimes life-altering events start out really small. It seemed insignificant. These unknown people, a young girl, a man, engaged, um, not really known people, not famous people, but God chose them to bring His Son into the world. And just like some of us, all ahead was a one word from God. And it didn't sound very likely. And it didn't even sound possible. And yet, they believed the word that God gave them. They trusted in it, and they received what he said. You know, when this happened, this wasn't exactly something that was celebrated. Actually, it looked like they had broken the law of Moses. It looked like they had committed fornication, which would have been punishable by death in those days, according to the law of Moses. Which is why Joseph was thinking about putting Mary away secretly. He knew she would be killed. And instead of having a big wedding celebration, which was normal in those days, the whole town would come and celebrate, and and they would drink, and they would eat, and they would be happy for days on end. Instead of having that, Joseph very quietly just took Mary home to live with him. Probably people were gossiping behind their bags. Wonder if when Mary went to the well to draw water, some of the other women shunned her. Or if Joseph was made to feel hmm, something wrong with you, boy, when he was working. We don't know. But this came with a price. These two people were willing to pay that price. The price of rejection. The price of isolation. The price of being misunderstood. But because they were willing to obey God, Jesus was able to come and live among us. So we want to look at a couple places where it describes the steps of obedience these people took. Let's start off in Luke chapter 1. Let's look at when the angel came to Mary. You know, it took faith on Mary's part to accept what that angel said. Sounded pretty crazy, didn't it? Let's start at verse 26, Luke chapter 1. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You know, Mary wasn't questioning and saying, oh, I don't know, my God, if you can really do this thing. She was simply asking uh, logistically, how can this be? When she got her answer, she just accepted it. She just accepted it. Different than Zacharias. When the angel told Zacharias, he said, we're too old. It can't happen. Mary just simply accepted it. And she said, be it done to me according to your word. That's words of obedience. 
And that's why when she met her cousin Elizabeth, a couple weeks later, Elizabeth said in verse 45, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Mary believed it. The angel told her, and she simply believed it. And she received it too. That was Mary's faith. But what about Joseph? Well, it also took Jason, uh, faith on Joseph's part. Let's look at Matthew chapter 1. You know, thinking about it, Joseph could have easily rejected the words of the angel. You know that? He could have let his pride get in the way. He said, I'm not taking her. Can I really believe that? Why would I marry that woman? But he didn't. He knew it was God, and he simply accepted what God said. Let's look at Matthew chapter 1. Let's start with verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now this all took place that what was spoken by the Lord to the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph arose from his sleep, and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took her as his wife, and kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Joseph was quick to obey. He didn't question around. He didn't ask other people's advice. He got out of bed. He put his clothes on, and he went over to Mary's door, and he said, Come on. You're coming home with me. You are now my wife. Instant obedience. That's the way we got to be. And three more times when Jesus was a small child, this happened again. That Joseph had to act quickly to save Jesus' life. And look at chapter 2. First it was in verse uh, 13. It says in 14. And when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Now verse 14. And he arose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. He left his own country. How many of us are ready to leave the country? Like that. Because God said so. But he did it. And also, in verse um, 21 again. He had been in Egypt now. Actually, back at 20, I'll read 21st. It says, The angel of the Lord spoke to Joseph in a dream again while they're in Egypt and said, Arise and take the child and his mother and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he arose and took the child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. So he obeyed again a second time. And then a third time. In verse 22, he heard it again. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he departed for the regions of Galilee and came and resided in a city called Nazareth. So Joseph was quick to obey what God said. And these are major things. How many of us can jump and move like that? Three times. Go to Egypt. Go to Israel. Don't settle there where you've been. Go to another part of the country. This is pretty far away. Nazareth is from uh, Judea. But he simply did it. Simply obeyed. Because Joseph and Mary were quick to obey, Jesus' life was protected, and he was able to grow up and become who he, who he was. You know, Jesus' birth itself did not look very spectacular. Let's go back to Luke chapter 2 and look at that. Luke chapter 2. Luke 2, let's start at verse 1. Now it came about in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. 
This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all were proceeding to register for the census, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And it came about that while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Wasn't a nice hospital. It wasn't even a nice place at their own house with all the neighbors rejoicing with them. It was a manger. They might have had to clean a stall before she could give birth. Think about it. Cows over there mooing, whatever else was in there, sheep, whatever was in there doing their thing. Cleaned out that manger, which is basically the, the food trough for the cows. Cleaned it out, put fresh straw in, cleaned off a spot in the floor, and Mary had Jesus right there in the manger, in that barn. In the barn. Many people would have said, man, these people are poor. What in the world? Many people would have looked down on them for giving birth in a barn. And yet, God had a plan. Let's read on at verse 8. You know, while the world would have looked down on them, heaven was rejoicing. Start at verse 8. And in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And it came about when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then, and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in haste, and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they'd seen it, they made known the statement which, they had been, which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things that were told them by the shepherds. Skip to verse 20. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. God was so happy. Jesus had come to earth. People had obeyed him. All the prophecy that had been spoken through the years from the Garden of Eden, when he said to Eve, you will, you will bruise his head, and he will bruise your heel, and you will bruise his head, said to that snake, meaning the devil. The day would come when Jesus would bruise the head of the devil. And all the prophecies and Old Testament types clear up to here, and now came to pass. God was happy. And these people, these shepherds, you notice that the angel said, Today was born for you a Savior. He didn't say for the children of Israel. He didn't say for the whole world. He said for you. Right there. Whatever your name is. And you and you and you. A Savior is born for you. It would depend on them if they would receive him or not. But the Savior was born for them. Personal. It's always personal with God. He looks at us as individuals. Yeah, he sees us as nations, but he sees us as individuals. And he cares so much about each individual that he would send Jesus just for one. Someone else also responded to the message of Jesus' birth. And those were some people from pretty far away. We'll go back to Matthew chapter 2 and look at the wise men. Matthew 2. These people were not Jews. These people were what would be called heathen. And yet, they must have had a sensitivity to God because they recognized the star. Let's look at Matthew 2, start at verse 1. But after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? 
For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. We saw his star in the east and we've come to worship him. If you read on in this chapter, you see that Herod found out how long they've been traveling. It was about two years. Two years. Camels. Day after day. Desert. Don't know exactly which country they came to, but it probably wasn't really pleasant. And they kept going. I kept going. The star was there. Until they found that star, they weren't going to stop. Determined to obey God. Determined to see who the king of kings was. And they followed him. So let's look on at verse 8. It says, He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, make careful search for the child, and when you found him, report to me, that I too may come and worship him. And having heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star, which they'd seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they came into the house and saw the child with Mary his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Two years of travel. Jesus wasn't a baby. He was a toddler by now. And yet they recognized him. It's him. It's him right there. And they worshipped him. How many people would worship a toddler? But these men had insight. They knew that toddler will grow up. He will be a man. And God has made him. God has called him. He's significant. And they gave him their gifts as they worshipped him. These people that came represented us. This was the non-Jewish world. They could have been Africans. Who knows? Europeans. Anyone who could come within, within a two miles walking, riding distance. I mean, um, two years walking, riding distance. They could have come from Russia for all I know. They could have. They came from very far away. Far away. Representing us, the world. Jesus came for us. So all these people who came, came in obedience. Willing to do what God said. You notice the shepherds said, let us go quickly. Let's go quickly. They got up in the middle of the night, got the sheep up, and took off. Didn't wait around until it was convenient. We had to be that way too. If God said go, get up and go. If God says stay, don't move. Do it. It's these acts of obedience that look insignificant to other people that enable God to do big things in our lives. We have to be willing to obey whenever he speaks to us. And because these people obeyed, Jesus came and brought salvation to the whole world. We're going to read one more verse and then we're going to have a time of communion together and just worship him as our king of kings. Romans 5. And it sums it all up for us. Romans 5, verse 6 to 8. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's why Jesus came. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. 